Uh, nature and grace, certainly in the tradition of Aquinas, are correlative concepts. They can't be understood apart from each other in the context of Christian theology. Grace, obviously, is a perfection of nature. Uh, and as a perfection of nature, it, it's a quality. It's something that qualifies us in our humanities to be able to be friends of God, to relate to God as he is. Uh, I think the problem is many of us just kind of spontaneously think that grace is a thing, and, and we talk about it in quantitative terms. Oh, God will give me more grace, or this person has grace and this person doesn't, as if grace were a substance, a thing, but it isn't, it's a quality. And one of the examples I use in class is that of a, a white piece of paper. And a white piece of paper, we, we see the whiteness, but if we take the paper away, there's no whiteness. Whiteness is a quality of the paper. There is no whiteness without the paper. There is no grace without a human nature. Grace is not a thing, it's something that makes us to be in a different way. I've always just hated the phrase, grace builds upon nature, because it's like a second story of a house. It, it's a thing you're putting on top of nature. And it isn't, it's always a perfection of nature. I think we have to think about it as that, as a quality, as a perfected quality. And I think there's a lot of implications of that. One of them certainly is, is that if grace really is a perfection of nature, then grace can never harm, destroy, or contradict nature in any way. And so nature, in a sense, becomes a negative norm for grace. If somebody says God is telling them something or they are graced in a certain way and we see their humanities being diminished by that, we know it's not a grace. It can't be a grace. Grace is always a perfection of nature. And so nature is, is an important theological concept. One of the reasons is because it is a kind of a negative norm for grace. Uh, wherever there is grace, there is a, a fulfillment and a perfection and a flourishing of uh, our, our, our nature. Another uh, implication of that is it explains, I think, very well the moral ambiguities that we experience in ourselves and other people. I was struck many years ago when I knew a man who, on the one hand, seemed quite holy and was capable of, of doing marvelous Christian things. And yet, on the other hand, at certain times, in certain places, uh, a man out of whom came evil uh, and the ability to really hurt uh, and even destroy other human beings. It was very hard for me to put that together until I realized that if grace really is a perfection of our natures, Grace is in many ways dependent upon our natures. It's dependent upon, in some sense, the health of our cognitive faculties, our volitional capacities, our psychological and emotional capacities. And if we are really injured in our natures, if we don't have much healthy going for us psychologically or emotionally, where is this qualitative perfection that is grace going to be rooted? It has no matter to work on. It, it's a grace is a form, it's a formal quality, but it needs a matter to inform. And so you can have, I think, human beings that are in the grace of God. They are affected by grace, they're qualified by grace, but there are so many natural, you might say, pathologies uh, going on in their lives that it's very hard for grace to manifest. Uh, itself. In some areas of their lives it can, some areas of their lives that are healthier, in other areas of their lives it can't. And so you see this ambiguity, this moral ambiguity uh, in human beings. It stems, I think, from the very nature of the grace-nature relationship itself. Another implication, I think, of, of this relationship of grace and nature, uh, it explains the long Christian belief that we can never have absolute certainty whether or not we are in the grace of God. 
And the reason for that is we don't directly see grace. Grace is not a thing. We see ourselves. Uh, and, and we look at what we do, we look at our emotional life, uh, we look at our actions, and in a sense we can argue back and say, well, the things I'm doing look good. <laughs> the things I'm doing or other people, they look, they, they look Christian. But again, you're arguing back. It's an indirect argument because you don't see grace. We see ourselves and we see other people. So the most certitude we can have about being in grace is a moral certitude. It's based on the um, effects of grace. So I think ultimately the relationship of grace and nature uh, involves uh, what theologians call a hermeneutical circle, an interpretive circle, that we only can understand grace in the context of nature and we can only understand nature in the context of grace. Obviously, we can only understand grace in the context of nature. There is no grace without nature. Aquinas says at one point that the operations of grace are no less rational than the operations of nature. We understand the workings of grace in terms of the workings of nature. That's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, but the other holds also that if God really is the creator and the redeemer, God is the author of both grace and nature, and God created nature to be perfected by grace. And so we can never get kind of a pure philosophical understanding of nature that is adequate. Uh, nature, the understanding of ourselves and our world, in a sense, points forward to and needs the light of revelation to give us the fullest uh, understanding of it. So again, our, our, our uh, experience of nature in our own lives and the lives of others, of our own humanity, of our own world, is absolutely necessary for us to understand grace. And yet grace is absolutely necessary for us to understand nature. You can't escape, as it were, that interpretive circle.